Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am so delighted to see all of you here, and this is a great opportunity for me to welcome you to another lecture in our President's Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, as many of you know, and I'm looking around the room and I see a lot of familiar faces, we started this lecture series in the hope that we can uh, uh, create a forum for dialogue and discussion on issues related to the interface between science and technology on the one hand, and uh, some of the most vexing societal problems on the other hand. And we've remained very faithful to this objective that we had set, and all of the lectures that we've had in this lecture series have intentionally focused on this very important interface. So as you may remember, we have had lectures by Mr. Norm Augustine, former CEO of uh, Lockheed Martin, on the importance of science and technology in education. We heard from uh, Dr. John Holdren, uh, the science advisor of President Obama about the President's Science and Technology Initiatives. We heard from Dr. John Deutsch about uh, the role of science and technology in uh, uh, non-traditional uh, ways of uh, exploring oil and gas uh, with the tremendous uh, implications in uh, fracking technologies. And as uh, you all know, uh, the incredible impact of these te technologies on the price of oil and uh, all of the economic and uh, geopolitical uh, implications of it. And we heard from uh, Dr. Craig Barrett, former CEO of Intel, not too long ago on the interface between science and technology and economic development. Uh, of course, today we have another vexing societal problem, and that's healthcare. And I'm delighted that our speaker today will be speaking about uh, the role of science in advancements in cancer research. I do want to take uh, this opportunity to uh, express my deep gratitude to my uh, very, very good friend for my uh, former boss for more than two decades, uh, my mentor, uh, the current president of Rochester Institute of Technology, Dr. Bill Dessler, for his generous uh, support of this lecture series. Uh, also, before introducing our speaker today, I thought I would mention that our next uh, president's distinguished lecture will be on October 7th, and our speaker will be Ms. Sharmin Masavar Rahmani, who is the uh, Chief Investment Officer of Goldman Sachs. So we're transitioning from healthcare to the investment uh, business, and she will be talking about the interface between finance and uh, science and technology, and uh, I'm sure you will find that an interesting speech. Today, uh, we have uh, a truly distinguished uh, scientist, and speaker. Uh, when we started this lecture series, we wanted the lecture series to establish a reputation not based on the title of the lecture series, but based on the stature of the speakers and the quality of the presentations. And I am sure at the end of the day today, you will agree that this lecture series has established the right recognition for itself because of the quality of the speaker and the content of the speech. Today's speaker is Dr. Harold Varmus, who is a co-recipient of a Nobel Prize for studies of the genetic basis of cancer. He was nominated by President Obama as director of the National Cancer Institute and began his tenure as director of NCI on July 12th, 2010. Previously, he served as president and chief executive officer of Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and also as the director of the National Institutes of Health. Much of Dr. Varmus's uh, scientific work was conducted during 23 years as a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco, where he and Dr. Michael Bishop and their colleagues demonstrated the cellular origins of the oncogene of a chicken retrovirus. This discovery led to the isolation of many cellular genes that normally control growth and development and are very frequently mutated in human cancer. For this work, Drs. Bishop and uh, Varmus received many, many awards and recognitions, including the 1989 Nobel Prize for physiology or medicine. 
In 93, Dr. Varmus was named by President Clinton to serve as the director of the National Institutes of Health, a position that he held until 1999. Dr. Varmus, uh, and by the way, I am uh, intensely condensing his biographical sketch because uh, if I did not do that, uh, I would have occupied the whole hour going over his biographical sketch. He has authored over 300 scientific papers and five books, including an introduction to the genetic basis of cancer for a general audience and a memoir called The Art and Politics of Science, uh, published in 2009. He's been an advisor to the federal government, pharmaceutical and biotechnology firms, and many academic institutions, and was appointed by President Obama as co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, otherwise known as PCAST. He served on the World uh, Health Organization's Commission on uh, Macroeconomics and Health from 2000 to 2002, is a co-founder and chairman of the board of directors of the Public Library of Science, chaired the scientific board of the Grand Challenges in Global Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from 2003 to 2008, and now chairs the foundation's Global Health Advisory Committee. He's involved in several initiatives to promote science in developing countries, including the Global Science Corps. He's been a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences since 1984 and a member of the Institute of Medicine since 1991. He's received the National Medal of Science, the Vannevar Bush Award, and several, actually many, honorary degrees and prizes in addition to his Nobel Prize. I am uh, immensely grateful to uh, Dr. Varmus for finding time from this incredibly busy schedule to find time to come and speak to the um, Stevens community. After graduating from Freeport High School, he majored in English at Amherst College and uh, earned a master's degree in English at Harvard University. He's a graduate of Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons, worked as a medical student in a hospital in India, and served on the medical house staff at Columbia <laughs> Presbyterian Medical Center. He began uh, his scientific training as a public health service officer at the NIH, where he studied bacterial gene expression. Without further introduction, uh, <laughs> I ask you to please join me in welcoming Dr. Varmus. Merriman, thank you very much. Nice to be here for the first time uh, and uh, have a chance to take the Hoboken Ferry, which I've always admired, from the other side of the river. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm here today to tell you about a major transition in the way we approach the care of patients with cancer, um, a new way that's based on uh, dramatic changes in the way we understand this disease as a result of advances in genetics, molecular biology, biochemistry, and other, other important technologies. Uh, this change was acknowledged just recently when pres my president, not your president, but well, your president too, uh, made an announcement in the East Room of the White House just a couple of weeks ago of a new initiative in what's called precision medicine. Um, what he was saying, his hand outstretched, standing next to a model of DNA, is that science has progressed sufficiently that we can begin to think about science in a new way, in which, um, and the science of medicine in a new way, in which disease is defined at a molecular level and we can begin to think about preventing and treating disease, a theme that I will reiterate several times as we go through here, um, in a way that's based on the particular physical properties and genetic properties of that individual patient's disease. And he's announcing that he's giving, he's asking Congress to provide $70 million to the National Cancer Institute to accelerate our efforts to improve the care of patients with cancer based on these principles and with other initiatives uh, uh, that are linked to that one. Now, many of you think about this as personalized medicine, and I remind you that, that, uh, that words do matter. This is my view of personalized medicine. You know the patient and you're good to the patient. It's a kind of euphemism. And I'm much more interested in, in what we call are much more fond of the term precision medicine, which was first used widely in a report from the Institute of Medicine a few years ago, in which the emphasis was placed on the notion that as we gather more and more 
information about disease, both from medical research, as shown in the lower part, and from studies of, of patients in clinical trials or simply patients being observed in treatment, uh, that uh, we acquire the knowledge that allows us to change the taxonomy of disease and to move from simple clinical observations or pictures of, of diseased tissue under the microscope to a classification of disease according to the molecular underpinnings of that disease. And that change is going to inform the kind of diagnosis we apply to the disease, the way in which we treat it, uh, the way in which we prevent it. We're going to influence outcomes that way. And all the, that is gathered during the course of that transformation of the, uh, the, the treatment of disease feeds back into a knowledge network. And I'll return to that knowledge network a little later. So my own view of, of uh, precision medicine is to say that, uh, that this effort redefines uh, diagnostic categories. Diagnosis is critical here. And using information about both disease mechanisms, and at this point, that means especially, as you'll hear in the case of cancer, the genetics of disease, um, and what we, learn about the, what we learn about the etiology of disease, which in the case of cancer is, um, is, is multiple, as I'll show you, um, and design more precise ways to both prevent and treat the disease. Now, precision medicine is not really a new concept, and um, other diseases than cancer, many other diseases, eventually all diseases, uh, come under this rubric, um, and uh, some moves toward precision medicine have been made long, in the, long ago in the past, arguably beginning with the, de the definition of the infectious agents of disease that make pneumonia into many different diseases depending upon whether the infectious agent is a virus or a bacterium like the tubercle bacillus or, or a fungal uh, infectious agent. Um, one of my favorite examples of uh, the early stages of precision medicine comes from the announcement by Linus Pauling that he had identified the precise change in the hemoglobin molecule that accounts for a disease known as sickle cell anemia, a disease that uh, had been defined in clinical terms many years earlier by showing that uh, this disease depended on a single change in one chain of the, uh, of the, of the hemoglobin molecule. And that, that uh, moreover, there was a physiological consequence, namely that uh, in uh, a deoxygenated state, uh, the hemoglobin molecule folded badly and the, the cell assumed a sickle shape and, um, and behaved badly in the bloodstream. And uh, Pauling said in a rather prescient way that he believed that medicine was entering a new era when progress will be much more rapid than before. That progress, one could argue, has not been quite as rapid as Pauling might have argued. And in fact, in 2015, we still don't have terrific treatment for sickle cell anemia. Nevertheless, I'm going to show you uh, a lot about um, a large set of diseases, which we often lump together as cancer, and hope to convince you that uh, while much more complex than virtually every genetic attribute, nevertheless, we're making a lot of progress, and the president's initiative to, uh, to increase funding and uh, activity to accelerate our understanding of cancer and our ability to control it uh, is in a very rapidly growing and productive phase. Now, cancer, as I've mentioned, is a large part of the precision medicine initiative. It's the starting point. There are other components to it. But why is he pointed to cancer? Well, for a number of reasons. One, of course, that I've put, not put on the slide, and then you all know this, is that cancer is a very common disease. Uh, about over 500,000 people in the U.S. will die from it this year. Over 7.5 million will die from it worldwide, and it's the, one of the more rapidly growing causes of death throughout the world as the population ages and um, poor countries uh, 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 have the resources to allow people to live longer. Um, it is an inherently genome-based disease that it, it, it arises from abnormalities in the genome that I'll say a lot more about in a couple of moments. And because of some of the tools we have available for analyzing uh, the, the, the DNA in our cells and the way in which that DNA is read out to make RNA and protein, uh, means that we have a tremendous amount of information to manage and therefore a lot of information with which to reconstruct the nosological or diagnostic categories that, uh, that are so meaningful. 
And as you'll see, we've made dramatic progress in some settings, that is in some certain kinds of tumors, but overall progress has been relatively slow. We're proud of the fact at the National Cancer Institute that death rates from cancer when adjusted for age have been dropping at about one to two percent per year for the last 20 years, but we still have a very high number of cancer caused deaths in this country, and I believe we can reduce that dramatically over the next several years. I need to caution you about one important thing. I'm going to stress the fact that cancer is a genetic disease, a disease of the genome. But it's also important to remember that this is really a, a very different kind of disease than the kind that you often think of as being a genetic disease, like the sickle cell anemia we mentioned briefly, a cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease and several others because cancers are the products of multiple mutations, not a single one, as in sickle cell disease. Furthermore, most of those mutations are what we call somatic, mutations that have occurred in um, non-germ cells uh, during the life of the, of the organism, beginning um, in infancy, possibly before, and continuing throughout life. And there are, in addition, contributions made by variations in our genes that are inherited. Secondly, um, the variation of mutations or genetic abnormalities that we encounter in cancer differs not only from one cancer type to another, but as you'll see, from one tumor of the same type to the next case of the same general kind of tumor. Then that is what's driving this more uh, precise uh, redefinition of tumor, of tumor types. Third, although some of these mutations are functional, some have just occurred during the growth of the tumor. They're passenger mutations, and that creates a problem in trying to understand when you analyze the genome of a cancer, what is significant biologically and deserves attention as a target in treatment and what does not. And then cancers are undergoing a kind of evolutionary change. I take note of the fact today, February 11th, is not only Abraham Lincoln's birthday, it's also the birthday of Charles Darwin. More about that in a moment. Um, and because cancer cells are undergoing an evolutionary process that I'll display in more detail in a moment, uh, they're under selection. If they allow a cell to grow better, if they prohibit a cell from dying, as many cells do in the course of normal uh, development, uh, if they make the cell resistant to some kind of therapy that one's administering, that is a selective advantage that, that allows that subclone of an original cancer clone to grow. So these are all features we're going to talk about in just a couple of moments. Before we get there, let me lay down a couple of basic facts about cancer that uh, just so we can be sure we're all more or less on the same page. So first, cancer occurs in virtually every organ in the body. Very different frequencies in different organs, but Hundreds of different types of cells are affected by cancerous change. Second, we know a fair amount about the causes and risk factors for cancer. We know that tobacco use is responsible for at least 30% of cancers in the United States and 85% of lung cancers. We know of other risk factors like exposure to UV light and sunlight, uh, certain viruses like hepatitis B virus and human papillomavirus. We know about uh, uh, Hereditary contributions to cancer growth, with about uh, seven or eight percent of, uh, of cancers being uh, driven by inherited mutations, like mutations in the BRCA1 gene. Uh, and we know that uh, cancer, is, cancer rates are higher among the obese, those who don't exercise, and cancer, of course, is more frequent as we age. And as I've already made Apparent cancer is, is a disease of the genome with many different kinds of mutations that you'll see in deta great detail. But that pattern of mutation has marked heterogeneity, uh, and yet there are also some commonalities we'll speak about near the end of the lecture. Now, what can we now do about cancers? Well, uh, we know we can prevent some with vaccines. Important to remember that um, that there are at least two important anti-cancer vaccines: one against human papillomavirus and one against uh, uh, human hepatitis viruses. Those are important to use more widely than they are used today. And we know that we can improve the likelihood, the, the, uh, the likelihood of, of escaping cancers 
by maintaining a normal weight, good exercise patterns, um, and uh, most importantly, by not smoking. We have the tools to detect some tumors early, although those can be much improved. We have increasing tools for diagnosing cancer more and more accurately through precision medicine. Uh, we can cure some through surgery, radiotherapy, and conventional chemotherapies. Uh, we can control the growth of others. Uh, and we have important tools for controlling some of the symptoms of cancer. And it's important to remember these things because these staples of cancer care and cancer prevention should not be neglected just because today I'm going to tell you a lot more about uh, how precision medicine is addressing, helping us address some of the uh, more difficult problems in cancer uh, treatment in particular. So what we have not been able to do is several fold. First, we haven't been able to, to, to prevent most cancers, even with all the tools we have available. If they were, if they were um, stringently implemented, we'd probably only protect uh, the human population by, from 40 or possibly 50 percent of cancers. Uh, we have um, difficulty in predicting the outcomes of, of uh, cancers when they're detected early. We um, are very uh, impoverished in our methods to, uh, to cure, even chronically control, uh, so-called metastatic disease, disease that spread from the primary site of a cancer elsewhere in the body. And we have been unable to eliminate all the complications of the rigorous therapy that is frequently employed. And the costs of cancer care continue to rise, uh, especially as we introduce some of the new magical drugs I'll be telling you about. Now, I want to give you one example of something we already know that precision uh, cancer care can provide. And by focusing on one disease very, very briefly, um, because that disease has become a poster child for precision medicine, a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia a disease we've known about for about 150 years, defined by the kinds of cells that overgrow the body and almost always lead to death within five years of diagnosis. There are about 6,000 cases a year of this disease in the U.S. Um, and uh, roughly 120,000 cases worldwide. Uh, the disease is characterized by an abnormal chromosome, which shown here is a picture taken in 1960 by the discoverers of that chromosome. Uh, and you can see the 23 pairs of our normal chromosomes with an arrow showing you the one abnormal chromosome that's present in virtually every, um, in, the, in the abnormal cells of virtually every patient with this form of leukemia. That's called the Philadelphia chromosome because of the town in which it was discovered. Uh, and over the course of uh, about 12 years, um, molecular biologists figured out that that funny looking chromosome is actually a pastiche of pieces of chromosome 22 and chromosome 9, creating uh, a fusion between two genes, one of which had already been known to be a cancer-causing gene, uh, a gene that makes an enzyme, uh, and that enzyme can be inhibited by a drug that was being developed for some other purposes. Uh, this is a three-dimensional picture in blue of the enzymatic portion of, that, of the fusion protein made by the fused genes from chromosomes 9 and 22, and the drug called imatinib officially, but uh, commercially is sold as Gleevec, uh, inhibits the enzyme by binding to the active site of the enzyme. And it was shown very quickly that uh, because uh, virtually every patient with chronic myeloid leukemia has this fusion gene that makes the fusion protein that can be inhibited by this drug, the drug uh, rapidly places people into a dramatic remission. And at this point, um, it is a drug that can be very commonly taken uh, throughout life and it restores a normal life expectancy to patients who normally would die in their 40s or 50s. This is a remarkable drug and it illustrates some other important properties that there are other, there are at least three enzymes, all similar to this one, that uh, um, that can be inhibited by this drug, and those other enzymes are frequently mutated in various ways uh, in the development of certain other cancers. And this drug is also very effective in treating those other cancers, some of which are not uncommon, and one of which is not a leukemia, but a solid tumor of the intestines. So a remarkable development, and one that illustrates the potential to 
um, to use a much more precise diagnosis, namely saying this is a disease in which certain chromosomes are fused together and a novel uh, constitutively active enzyme is made. Now, making this kind of approach much more generalized required a much more generalized approach to human genomes and especially genomes that come from cancer cells. And the, the visionary statement that was made uh, now almost exactly 30 years ago was made by uh, a renowned um, uh, virologist, Renato Del Becco, who received a Nobel Prize for his work on the viral causes of cancer, when he said that we ought to be using what were then still pretty primitive tools for doing DNA sequencing, that is for looking at the arrangement and sequence of nucleotides in DNA. And although this seemed like a very bold, even outrageous statement at the time, over the course of uh, the years when he published this, 1986 uh, to the year 2003, it was possible to develop new, new tools for determining the, the complete organization of the human genome and produce um, a version that I'm sure you're all aware of because this is a, a blueprint for, for uh, human life that has guided um, a great deal of thinking about medicine and biology and also been uh, an instrumental in virtually every piece of, uh, of sophisticated bio biology that has been this being done in modern laboratories. Importantly in all this, because the initial deciphering of the human genome cost a couple of billion dollars, the cost of sequencing uh, uh, DNA of all kinds, particularly human DNA for our purposes today, uh, has fallen precipitously. And uh, although uh, this slide is not up to date, ends in 2011, uh, at this point it's possible to have a complete human genome, all three billion base pairs, uh, determined uh, with, uh, the, with new kinds of machines for sequencing DNA uh, at a cost of only a couple of thousand dollars. So that's a remarkable change and it's, in, it's very significant in the history of of uh, medicine as well as the, the, the study of biological systems because it means that you can bring the analysis of the human genome uh, into uh, a reasonable cost structure so that it's possible to think about uh, analyzing the genome of every cancer that's encountered in every individual. So in response to these, some of these new developments, the National Cancer Institute in collaboration with one of our fellow institutes uh, developed something called the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA, in which um, initially with some pilot projects with certain forms of cancer listed on the left, um, a large number of methodologies were, were applied to the study of, of individual human cancers so that we could look at the DNA sequence, the chromosome copy number, whether genes are expressed or not expressed, and many other features of, of the human genome and the interpretation of the genome by a cell using uh, a large number of uh, team efforts that uh, included analysis of the, the tissue samples, uh, characterization of many properties of the genome, sequencing the entire genome, analyzing all the data, and then coordinating the data to make published papers. And the result has been uh, the proliferation of papers that describe uh, from a few hundred to several hundred tumors of a distinct type, generating a, a mass of data, so-called big data, uh, that uh, allows um, a, uh, the first pass at uh, analyzing in depth what kinds of abnormalities are seen across the spectrum of tumor types and among individual tumors of a single type to begin to give us some idea of how to approach these cancers and from a variety of perspectives. I remind you that, uh, something that I've already actually illustrated, that, that uh, mutations can, uh, or abnormalities of DNA can occur in various, in various forms, most commonly in, uh, in both thought and experimental result of mutations that just change a single letter, a single nucleotide in, in, in a chromosome to change uh, its uh, potential for encoding uh, an amino acid that gets inserted into a protein. But other very significant changes include deletions or amplifications of DNA, and as you've seen in the case of chronic myeloid leukemia on the, and on the right, uh, translocations of chromosomes to create fusion genes. And there are other examples of 
aberrations that are less frequent than these, but this gives you some sense of the variety of changes that may underlie cancers. Now, from the vast amount of activity that's gone on in the study of cancer genomes, uh, we have a number of, uh, of important messages. We, I've already indicated to you that these, uh, that these genotypes, that is the constellation of changes in the genome of a single cancer, are complex. I'll show you how complex in a moment. Uh, they're very varied, uh, and they define particular subtypes of tumors in a way that's influential in selecting uh, therapies. Um, some of the, many of these changes affect the way cells talk to themselves, how they, how they decide uh, when they're going to grow, when they're going to die, whether they're going to invade, whether they're going to do other things that are important in the governance of cell behavior. Uh, and then the nature of the changes forms a kind of signature that may be informative, as I'll show you, about what is causing the mutations. And it is the cause of the mutations that ends up being uh, the, uh, the, 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 the mechanism by which a cancer arises and important to understand. And then this information, which is vast, needs to be assembled to guide cancer care and further uh, pr promote the clinical research that, need, that leads to actual changes in the way we practice medicine. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of examples to show you, uh, uh, illustrate these in a little more detail uh, using some patient material and some experimental work. Um, the first point is that the cancer genomes um, are extremely complex, and to try to give you a sense of that, uh, we've uh, borrowed some work from the Broad Institute uh, that shows across, the, across the, the bottom a number of different kinds of tumors, lung tumors, kidney tumors, leukemias, and so forth, and um, it shows the number of mutations um, per genome and shows it as a, as a density measurement, the number of mutations per million bases. And there are a couple of things that are very obvious. First, the, the, the number of mutations per individual tumor can range over 10, 100, even 1,000 fold. The number of mutations is much higher in certain kinds of tumors, especially those tumors that arose as a result of exposure to some of the mutagens I've, I've mentioned earlier, such as use of tobacco or exposure to UV light. So on the absolute furthest right, there's melanoma, a disease which is strongly influenced by exposure to UV, where there are as many as 10 to 100,000 mutations in the single genome. On, on the left, there's some tumors that arise in childhood without exposure to identified mutagens that may only have 10 or 100 mutations per genome. These are dramatic variations. In the middle is shown the display of the kinds of mutations, bases going from a C to a T or, or a T to an A, uh, and those clearly give very different pictures. For example, the melanoma on the right is characterized by a high level of the C base to the T base, and that's reflected in the large amount of yellow. And at the bottom is shown um, a display of what a human genome looks like when um, put into what's called a circus plot, where all the chromosomes are lined up, or not lined up, but they're placed into a circle, and the uh, arcs between parts of the circle indicate chromosomal translocations. Uh, some of the other markings indicate the presence of mutations, and you can see that the density of mutations is much greater as the, muta as the number of mutations goes up, and in general, the complexity of the, of the genomic aberrations gets much higher when you look at some of these tumors that have arisen uh, in people who have been exposed to UV light or to, uh, or, or to other, uh, other carcinogens, uh, the mutagens. This is a way of giving you a, 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 some sense of how varied the genomic patterns are in individual tumors that would be called the same thing by someone looking through a microscope. So what is shown here across the, in, in, on the horizontal axis, are something in the order of 230 patients, uh, tumors from those patients, uh, all adenocarcinomas of the lung, uh, one of the most frequent human uh, tumors with a very high mortality rate. And across the, uh, on the vertical axis are listed some of the genes that are found mutated uh, multiple times uh, within these cancers. And the first thing you can see is how heterogeneous the pattern is. That is, that there is no tumor that looks exactly like every, any other tumor. 
Um, the numbers of mutations vary dramatically. Uh, the kinds of mutations vary. And if you look at the actual genes, I'm not going to go through them individually, but at the top, there are several genes that have been known to be cancer-causing genes for a long time. And they, they are found mutated. Some of those are found mutated very frequently in these tumors. But there are quite a few others that have not been known to be cancer genes. Uh, they are maybe mutated a few times in this set of 230 patients. It's very hard to know which of these are actually driving the behavior of the cancer and which ones are just passengers that happen to be mutated uh, during the course of the, the uh, development of this tumor. So from some of this data, it's nevertheless been possible to begin to look um, at which tumors are driven by mutations in which genes, because this is the critical element if you're trying to develop new therapies for treating this disease. And you can see that now for this fairly common cancer, there are only about a quarter of these tumors where we don't have a known cancer driver mutated. Um, in a third, there's a gene I'll mention near the end of the lecture called RAS that is mutated, but we can't it doesn't help us to, have, to know that's mutated. We don't have therapies for cancers that are driven by that gene. Um, but for many of the others, we do have new drugs that are frequently very powerful in uh, inducing a remission in the disease in those individuals. And that is pretty remarkable. Uh, one, of those, uh, one of those drugs is called crizotinib. It's about midway down on the left. It was developed initially and used initially for treatment of patients who have an abnormality of a gene called ALK. But there are, other, there are some patients who have mutations in a, in a gene called ROS, and that turns out to be uh, a mutant protein that uh, can be treated using the same drug that works for some other uh, lung car carcinomas. And this is an example of how a patient, just after seven weeks, uh, has a dramatic reduction in the number of of, of active cancers, growing cancers that are detected in this case by a so-called PET scan with the, the cancer sites being um, lit up as, uh, as black dots on the left-hand side and eliminated after seven weeks of treatment with this drug. And virtually every patient here gets benefit and there is life extension. Let me say something about mutational signatures. Um, when you look at uh, an individual cancer, uh, as has been done through the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, it's often the case that when you uh, line the mutations up um, by the nature of the change in the wording of DNA and the base, base changes, that uh, the patterns look very different. Uh, for example, looking at a melanoma on the left, or a lot of melanomas on the left, and a lot of uh, lung cancers, in this case, squamous cell cancer of the lung on the right. And what that implies is that different uh, mutational forces are at work, and that indeed is the case. We know in melanoma the major force is UV radiation from the sun, and on the right the major mutational force is the other uh, carcinogens or mutagens present in tobacco smoke, and that's why very different patterns are observed. Mike Stratton and his colleagues in England have taken this to a much, uh, much higher degree of sophistication and have defined now 22 signatures that are based on the kinds of changes in DNA that are seen in individual cancers. And they've been able to link, in about half of these cases, the, the signature with some um, mutational force. Uh, if you look across different kinds of cancers, um, as we did in a previous slide with melanoma and a form of lung cancer, but here with many others, you can see that different signatures are present to different extents in different tumors, telling you something about the origin of those tumors, and that's obviously a useful thing to do, uh, and with strong implications for how we might prevent certain kinds of cancer or how we might make a diagnosis very early on just from finding a few cancer cells, perhaps even in the bloodstream. And what uh, Stratton and his colleagues then begin to envision is a way to take the final set of data that one gets out from analyzing a cancer genome and looking back with mathematical tools to figure out which kinds of signatures are embedded in this one overall um, outcome of the analysis and begin to predict uh, which kinds of mutational drivers uh, are responsible for making all these mutations. 
I want to say something about tumor evolution, not just because it's Darwin's birthday, but also because it's an important way to think about cancer in the modern age. This is a diagram that was drawn up by uh, Charles Swanton, a cancer biologist at the Cancer Research, the cancer research Organization in the UK. Um, what he's showing here, uh, starting at the bottom, is the cell in the, in the kidney that eventually becomes a cancer cell. And that is a, a deduction based on the analysis of three pieces of tumor, R8, R4, R2 at the top, uh, these are taken from different sites in an individual who recently died of, of this cancer. And by looking at the mutations in those sites and, and other sites that were sampled, it's possible to develop a, a kind of um, uh, evolutionary pattern by which mutations were acquired, uh, influenced the outgrowth of subclones of a renal cell that was initially mutated, um, as shown near the bottom, by a, a change in the gene called the VHL gene. And you, by recreating this kind of pattern, you can see how from a single cell in the kidney, a whole cluster of, of different subclones were generated. And this is not unlike what was drawn by Charles Darwin uh, a very long time ago when he first began to envision in, in his diaries uh, how the evolution of species might have arisen. Uh, we often refer to the kind of diagram that, that, that Darwin drew that, that uh, reflect the emergence and persistence of species as survival of the fittest and in response to uh, selective forces. On the left, we're talking about uh, an evolutionary process that favors the survival of the most deadly cells. So the patient is affected in a, in a, in a disastrous way by uh, the survival of cells that uh, are, are now programmed to invade and to destroy uh, organs that are vital for life. But these are two um, dramatically similar uh, kinds of exercises in which one form of evolution, spe evolution of species, can be contrasted with the evolution of cells that, that uh, create a cancer that is ultimately lethal for the individual carrying it. How does this information get gathered? Well, here's one example, again, from uh, Charles Swanton's work, where two samples are taken from the lungs of, a, of, a, of one individual um, and analyzed, and then uh, by looking at the genetic abnormalities, the genomic changes, in each of those two samples from different parts of the, the lungs, you can figure out what must have been present in precursor cells that are shown in purple on the left that then diverged when, when some other event drove one cell into two separate uh, lineages. Uh, you can count the number of mutations. You can see how many were in common. You can see a change uh, that occurred in the mutational processes themselves. Uh, and you can begin to make some guesses about which genes may have been driving uh, the uh, evolution of this more complex cancer. And immediately you'll see that, that if you find um, a gene that you might, want to, might be able to attack with a drug on one limb of this evolutionary tree but not the other, that treatment is not going to be successful because you want to eliminate the entire cancer, not just one arm of, a, of an evolutionary tree. This is linked to an important problem I haven't mentioned yet, that in precision medicine, we have as one of our greatest problems uh, the appearance of drug resistance. One can envision that uh, administration of an inhibitor of some process, like the enzyme we mentioned in chronic myeloid leukemia, as being a kind of selective force that uh, operates against the growth of a cancer. So a single cell that can escape that force uh, as a result of a, an additional mutation uh, has a growth advantage, and that's what happens all too frequently in the use of many of our new medicines that are based on, on precision medicine. Uh, and that, again, is, a, is an aspect of tumor evolution that is discouraging to the individual and to the doctor taking care of him. And this diagram, which we don't need to go through in detail, just illustrates the fact that, that, uh, that when we first encountered this sort of acquired resistance to a drug like Levac, that the resistance emanated from a secondary mutation in the target. So the target retains its activity as an enzyme, but now is folded in a way that makes it impervious to the actions of the drug. 
And this is something we see very often, not just in chronic myeloid leukemia, but also in many other diseases in which mutations affecting enzymes can allow that enzyme to escape the inhibitory influences of some of the new drugs that we are now so proud of. Uh, and the situation is actually a lot more complicated than that. And this is work from uh, my colleague Levy, Levy Garraway in, in Boston, who has been studying the resistance of, of metastatic melanoma to a drug which is frequently used to treat patients whose disease has resulted from a mutation in one gene called BRAF that's mutated in over half of all melanomas. And while the drug is great initially, uh, almost everybody becomes resistant in part because uh, there are so many ways to get around uh, the, the action of the drug. And this slide illustrates the multiplicity of genes that can un undergo secondary mutations that make uh, the cancer cell resistant to the drug. And th those resistance mechanisms actually involve different kinds of signaling that the cell carries out uh, in its efforts to direct the cell to continue growing despite the presence of the drug. Let me say a couple of things about clinical trials, because one of the goals, of course, is to understand what's wrong with the cancer cell, find a drug that inhibits some aberrant enzyme or other factor, and then try to use that in the clinic to uh, improve the health of cancer patients. Um, and the cancer trial uh, mechanisms uh, are now somewhat changed. Instead of taking 1,000 patients with, can with a cancer type that's diagnosed under the microscope and splitting those patients into a control group and a group receiving the drug, uh, now we can refine our approach to these to these patients and their disease based on some of the genetic criteria that I've been describing for you. There are two ways to try to do that. Uh, one involves moving from what we call the phenotype, the behavior of, of the tumor in a particular patient, back to a definition of the genetic changes that that patient exhibits. And the other is to go the other way, to define the patient first by analyzing the cancer genome and then moving to um, the use of a drug to see if it works against a cancer with a certain change in genes. So the first type is quite interesting from a, from a sociological and, and a historical point of view because this, is, this involves going back to trials that already occurred uh, and to say, well, most, most drug tests for uh, new cancer drugs are failures. And yet, in most of those trials, a few percent of patients do show a response, but the response is not frequent enough or for, for people to have accepted in the past without information about the genetic changes that now redefine the disease to establish the, 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 the value of the drug. And the whole point here is to identify those rare patients or occasional patients who have had a positive response to a drug despite the fact that, that most patients with the same disease have not, and to look with the kind of genetic tools, DNA sequencing tools, for example, to try to figure out uh, why, um, why the patient was an exceptional responder, and then to test other patients with the same genetic change to see if they'll respond to that drug as well. A classic example of this, published a couple of years ago from David Solid's lab at Sloan Kettering, uh, involves a 73-year-old man with, with a, a bladder cancer, um, and I, probably very few of you here are uh, familiar with, with uh, looking at cancers on a CAT scan, but there is, you'll have to take my word for it, in the pretreatment sample, a large amount of tumor uh, in the abdomen of this individual. Uh, and he was enrolled in a trial of a drug called Everolimus, um, a drug that um, uh, has a specific activity against uh, a known enzyme, uh, and uh, this patient was one out of only a couple who were uh, of 45 who were enrolled in this trial who actually had a response. And when the, when the patient's DNA was examined in, uh, by looking at the original tumor, uh, it was found that uh, there was a, a, a mutation in a gene happens to be named TSC, uh, and that is a gene that normally controls the activity of the enzyme that's inhibited by the drug that was being used here. And when that was figured out, um, then uh, the investigators went back and looked at a number of other uh, stored tumor samples and were able to show that, that 
the, the mutation in the same gene, the TSC gene, uh, was found in other patients who had more modest responses, but positive responses with, uh, uh, with uh, shrinkage of the tumor, not as dramatic as in the case that we were just talking about, but, uh, and the other patients who, whose disease continued to, uh, to progress uh, did not have mutations in this gene at all. So this becomes uh, a, a drug that one would use in this setting or possibly other tumor settings if there's a mutation in the TSC gene. And this kind of approach is being applied now very widely uh, to go back to clinical trials and try to make, uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, even though the drug seemed to fail initially, that there was actually something to be discovered from patients who were exceptional responders. The other way to do trials now is to, is to analyze uh, the, the genetic abnormalities in the class of patients who all have the same disease um, based on a microscopic examination, and then to match the mutations with drugs that are designed to interfere with the activity of the, mut of the, of the mutant proteins. And not unexpectedly, we've called these match trials, um, and these are trials in which we enter patients who have, whose tumors have failed to respond to conventional available therapies. So these patients are placed into a trial and given a selected drug only when they have a certain genetic abnormality as opposed to a much broader diagnosis. One example of the kind of responses that we have seen in this setting is provided by this uh, young boy who was diagnosed uh, some years ago with, uh, with a B cell leukemia. And uh, without going into the details, I just tell you that he failed to respond to conventional chemotherapy and therefore was not eligible for, uh, um, well, first of all, some of these kids are cured by drugs, others are simply put into a remission and then receive a transplant. But in this case, nothing could, further could be done. But then when his uh, chromosomes and DNA sequencing were examined more closely, it was found that he had a mutation in a gene that makes one of those enzymes that is susceptible to the inhibitory activity of the drug called Gleevec, the same drug that that treated chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, when when uh, this young man received, um, received that drug, within a matter of days, his bone marrow returned to normal. Um, the molecular markers, the abnormal chromosomes and the, the abnormal protein made from one of his abnormal chromosomes disappeared. And uh, you, you can see his name is Harrison with, with his oncologist. Uh, a couple of years later after receiving these drugs, and he remains in excellent health. And this is the kind of thing that we expect to see in many of the so-called match trials as we find drugs that are effective against uh, uh, precisely defined molecular lesions. You've all been hearing a lot about immune therapies. Um, I know the time is getting a little short, but I want to remind you that, that use, the use of the immune system is now, just on the course of the last few years, become another powerful way to approach the treatment of cancer. And that has happened in several ways. There are antibodies that can be made in the laboratory that, that attack cells with certain kinds of proteins on the surface. Uh, you can make those antibodies more effective by putting a piece of toxic protein onto the, uh, onto the antibody. But even more dramatically, it's now possible to inhibit the regressive forces in the immune system that normally prevent our immune cells from reacting against cancers. And uh, it's possible to change the genetic behavior of one arm of the immune system, the so-called T-cell arm of the immune system, by adding uh, genes that encode different kinds of receptors for those genes. And I uh, don't want to take too much time going through this, but the main point is it's now possible for us to define exactly what it is about a, an immune cell, like a T-cell, that allows it to recognize the tumor cell is foreign. And by blocking um, the suppressive tools that keep the T cell from reacting, uh, using an antibody against some of those uh, cell receptors, it's possible to unleash the power of the immune system in very powerful ways. And a recent issue of Nature Magazine summarizes some of these things uh, in a series of articles that make clear that not only is this a powerful new tool in cancer therapy, but that there is a precise molecular basis for some of these reactions. If you have a lot of mutations, including passenger mutations, they can be 
generating new kinds of proteins that the immune system responds to. Furthermore, um, by looking closely at those antigens, it's possible to recognize uh, strong stimuli to the immune system that are present in bacteria and viruses, and therefore use the precision of analyzing the cancer genome and the proteins that the cancer genome makes as a way of gauging whether or not a patient is likely to respond to immunotherapy. So let me say a couple of things about what remains to be done under the aegis of the President's uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, and I'll try to wrap up fairly quickly here so we can have some questions. So we still need to analyze more tumors. We've done a few hundred of various, cell, various cancer types, but that needs to be done in much greater depth. And this is a way of, I'm not gonna go through this, but, but folks at the Broad Institute have figured out ways to estimate how many tumors you'd have to look at if you wanted to find all the genes that are mutated in a significant way in roughly 2% of, of that tumor type. And that's obviously a somewhat arbitrary level of detection, but it's a reasonable one. And it's because mutation frequencies are different in different cancer types, uh, those different types require different levels of, of investigation to find all the, all the genes that are likely to play a role in that cancer at the 2% level. Secondly, we'd, we'd all like to be able to analyze single cells so that we can, rather than masses of, of thousands or millions of cells, to get a better picture of tumor evolution. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, would you rather look, count the, the fruit in a glass or a mixture of those fruits? And obviously, it's uh, easier to get uh, a picture of what's going on uh, by, uh, taking a, by understanding the nature of this brief metaphor. Third thing that now seems impossible, seems possible to do is to envision a time when we simply sample the blood of individuals and try to identify either cancer cells that are floating in the blood or DNA from, tumor cell, from tumors that are, that are in the blood. And by making use of some of the mutational signatures I mentioned earlier, begin to understand where those cancers may have come from and begin to interrupt uh, the, the growth of a cancer at a much earlier stage. A third thing to do is, is to begin to use cancer models, cancers that are engineered to occur in mice or cancers that are grown from cancer cells in humans under various conditions in a laboratory to make a better effort to understand how anti-cancer therapies work. In particular, uh, we're all particularly interested in, um, uh, in developing and testing combinations of, of cancer drugs or therapies, immune tools as well as, uh, as drugs, to try to circumvent drug resistance. And here we have to remember that, that it should be possible to do for cancer what we did for the treatment of HIV AIDS, where drug resistance was a very common problem in the early days of treatment of HIV AIDS, but has been uh, overcome by using combinations of drugs so that resistance does not arise. Uh, we know that there are cancers, many cancers, that have uh, mutations that affect the cell in a way that we can't reverse. And one of those is particularly important. I'm going to skip over this in, in, in detail, but there is a gene called the RAS gene, and actually there are three genes in this little family of genes that are mutated in as many as a third of all cancers. These are proteins that we understand biochemically in great detail. I'm not going to take you through that right now, but, but we know that those proteins bind uh, a uh, chemical in the body called GTP, and normally uh, they exchange GTP for its, uh, its product GDP in an efficient way, and that can't happen when the RAS gene is mutated, but we, d we haven't figured out ways to reverse the effect of those mutations. But these mutations are incredibly common in virtually all cases of pancreatic cancer, nearly half the cases of colorectal cancer, about a third of lung adenocarcinoma, uh, and uh, accounting for a very large fraction of, uh, of all human cancers in the United States. And we don't yet have a way to reverse that. So we have developed a, a, an initiative on one of our campuses of the NCI uh, to try to develop after 25 or 30 years of knowing uh, that this, that this uh, opportunity exists, but we've, it's a very, very tough problem to, uh, to solve. Uh, so we have a team of folks out there um, 
working um, in Frederick, Maryland, but linked up to scientists around the country, indeed around the world, to try to solve the RAS problem. And we're taking a lot of approaches um, that I'm not going to have time to go through in detail, but there are lots of new ways to think about this uh, now three-decade-old problem in cancer uh, biology and therapeutics to try to develop uh, ways to interfere with the action of, of mutant RAS genes. At near the bottom of the list, but very high in importance, is the need to develop informatics tools so that we can learn from these huge amounts of data that have been produced and to begin to disseminate the information to, in a more effective way to other scientists, to healthcare providers, and to patients who also want to know uh, what the, the driving abnormalities in cancers are and what kind of means we have for reversing them. And you remember from the very early part of this talk that the report from the Institute of Medicine about precision medicine uh, focused on the information that would be used to change the diagnostic classification of cancers. And that knowledge network is looming large in our vision of how the world is going to take up um, and pursue uh, precision medicine. Um, and uh, by bringing in to the knowledge network information that comes from a wide variety of sources, and then using that information to change diagnostic categories, promote biomedical research, and improve uh, the treatment of cancers in the clinic. Uh, so the National Cancer Institute has built a so-called genomic data commons. Uh, we're learning how to manipulate the information in that through cloud computing and to allow an individual investigator at their desktop computer to interface with these entities and improve analytic methods and uh, refine experimental approaches. Uh, and fundamental to all this is the, is the inclusion of patients in our thinking about research envisioning patients as altruistic cancer information donors who provide information uh, by supplying their tumor samples to investigators who then um, learn critical things about the, the nature of the underlying abnormalities, how patients are responding to therapies, uh, how drug resistance evolves, how the evolution of that cancer may have occurred and what effect it has on, on the likelihood that the cancer will have a bad outcome or a good one. Finally, there are some practicalities here. Uh, what are the economics of practicing oncology more precisely? What kind of tests are we going to develop? Uh, what kind of protocols are we going to be using for bringing patients into healthcare uh, and receiving precision medicine? This should not be only available for the elite. What kind of regulation will the FDA and others uh, uh, exercise? How do we ensure access to all, to both information and to care? And how do we uh, optimize the way in which patients provide consent for using their DNA and tumors in, in a, what will be eventually a, a, a worldwide uh, research process? Well, there is evidence to suggest that some of these problems can be solved. Uh, some years ago, the French Cancer Institute showed that it's more effective economically to test patients for mutations of, a, of an important gene in lung cancer than not to test them, that uh, when you test them, you assign them properly to receive or not receive the drug. When you fail to test them, too many people uh, receive a drug that's expensive and delay the, the application of what might be a more effective drug. And the, uh, in this case, the, the spared cost uh, that is achieved by spending a couple of million euros on testing is far outweighed by uh, the spared cost of not using the available drug called gefitinib for, for finding out whether or not a patient responds to a drug that they're not going to respond to without the, the, the mutation. Um, in thinking about how to do testing, there are lots of options, and depending on how many genes you want to look at, whether you want to look at the whole genome or just at a few hundred genes, uh, that affects uh, the cost and the degree to which you uh, look. Um, when patients come in, there's got to be a protocol for bringing them through a precision-based effort. Uh, and uh, as you can see, by making these uh, um, expedited and efficiently carried out, you can get information you need. These are, this is a, a, a rough estimate of how many things are in reasonably common use, at least at our cancer centers these days. The numbers are still relatively small. We don't have drugs for many of the abnormalities that we know are drivers of cancer. But 
I think you'll appreciate that what we've learned about cancer in the last 10, 20, 30 years is immense, that new information is being developed at a tremendously rapid rate. Our tools for analyzing that information, developing drugs and testing them has changed dramatically. And the president's uh, decision to give public utterance to the ambitions that we in the cancer research field have will further drive, I hope, the uh, ambitions of our investigators, the aspirations of patients, and uh, even possibly the appropriation-making process in Congress to give us the tools we need to do this kind of work. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to some questions. Dr. Varmus, that was a fascinating lecture. I'd be very interested in your experience um, and your view uh, of the questions? regulatory environment in which both clinical researchers and clinicians operate and whether you think there's sufficient flexibility for both clinical researchers and clinicians to access some of the investigational drugs or drugs that have failed clinical trials in order to provide benefits to their patients right. and the subjects of the sure. clinical trials. Well, this is obviously an issue that uh, uh, gets a lot of uh, blood pressures to rise. Uh, my, own, my own view, having worked closely with the FDA over the last five years or so, is the FDA is taking a very sophisticated science-based approach to what's happening in, um, in, in the new, new regime in oncology. There are real risks to using these drugs, and there are complications that people did not have to face before about deciding what kinds of tests are going to be used before we, uh, we subject a patient to potentially um, dangerous uh, drug that is also maybe expensive. And I, I personally believe that the FDA does have to have guidelines and some regulatory oversight of the kinds of tests that are being used and how, and how they're being used and what kinds of decisions are made. These tests, it's not always the FDA that needs to do the regulating, but I think they can provide some guidelines so that we know that, that patients are being tested in laboratories that can actually do the tests accurately, so that we know that the tests are being used in a way that's consistent with the scientific, scientific basis on which the drug was developed. Uh, and um, there will be choice. I, there, I, I can be quite sure from the conversations we've had that the FDA does not want to limit the number of the, the, the uh, enterprising nature of uh, people who are developing these tests, but, but uh, they, before they're widely used and when they're practiced, uh, the tests should be accurate and they should be testing for the right thing. And there will be, there already are drugs that, uh, that should be administered only when a certain kind of genetic test has been done. This is a big transformation because in general, hospitals don't do DNA sequencing, so the result is that uh, there's a new phase of the industry that's arising, um, exemplified by a number of companies like Foundation Medicine and others, that uh, represents a new enterprise, but a, a very useful one, and, and one that can be very efficient in providing uh, accurate testing at lower prices that might be available if every hospital has to develop its own methodologies. To what degree does proprietary profit motivation block the dissemination of information and pooling a knowledge network where different research entities share stuff? Yeah, well, it's an important question, and it's an issue that we're quite concerned about. Um, and by proprietary here, we no longer mean um, uh, having a patent on DNA. The Supreme Court has ruled on that. That's not the issue. But there are companies that, uh, that hold on to information they get when they do testing of patient, of patient samples. And they do that in part because there are people who would like to buy that information. And uh, this has created a couple of complications. One is that we know that no single entity is going to have enough information to allow um, the analysts in the world to pool as much information as possible to come to important um, conclusions about prognosis, likelihood of response to drugs. So I personally believe that as much information as possible ought to be gathered together for the analysis to come. Um, but there are nevertheless, there, it is possible to hold on to that information and, and then to provide it um, in, to, um, uh, 
drug companies and others that, that might want to have a special, special access. There is a movement worldwide called the Global, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that is, uh, has been joined by the NIH and several institutes, by many academic institutions, by many companies. Um, and the effort here is to set some standards for how uh, genetic information should be um, should be dealt with in, 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 the, in the course of uh, medical research and, and, and health care. Uh, no one denies the, the, the commercial possibility of applying to such databases uh, new tools that will be useful uh, and should be paid for um, by uh, folks who would like to use them. But most of us who see that um, almost everything that is generated has been, has been generated with, uh, with the help of public funds, that the data itself should be in open repositories. The NIH has a shared data policy that's quite vigorous, and uh, it's, I think it, we ought to be careful about what we allow people to commercialize, and um, uh, you, you cannot prevent a company from saying it's going to hold on to its data and try to sell it, but I think there are pos is possible for other holders of data, especially massive amounts of data, to compete with that and to allow large data sets to be analyzed and, and then let the, the commercial world come in and, and, and develop better ways for looking at that data and trying to transform it into useful information for healthcare providers or patients. My question is, how much significant this can prove in cancer research and or in a gene sequencing? Of course, DNA sequencing is not 100% accurate, if that's what your point is. And, and uh, it is a truism and a, and, a, and a worrisome truism that if you give the same DNA sample to three uh, sequencing units, you will get some differences in results. Um, we all, always try to overcome that by, um, by doing what's called deep sequencing, that is every molecule gets sequenced uh, um, hundreds of times. Uh, if not thousands, and uh, there are ways to try to correct for error, but error does occur in these circumstances, and that is an important consideration that related to the question of the degree to which DNA testing should be regulated. Uh, the, the, the problem is confounded in the case of cancer by something that I didn't go into in detail, but you might have, it might have occurred to you from what I said, and that is that because a cancer is continuing to evolve, any single piece of a tumor is likely to have different subclones of the original tumor in, 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 in the mass. And that means that, that some mutations will not be in every cell, they'll be in some cells. And if you analyze that DNA, it might only be in 1% or 5% of the cells, in which case it may be hard to detect and hard to interpret. Because what do you do? Do you respond? to a finding of a, of a mutant cancer gene uh, in, a, in a tumor in which it appears to be in only uh, 5 or 10 percent of the cells. So this question of, of distinguishing an error from a low-frequency event uh, is, a, is, a, is a difficult one, and the inherent um, uh, error-proneness of, of sequencing, especially certain sequences uh, where there are, for example, runs of identical nucleotides can be a serious problem, and uh, that's, again, a, a nuance and, and sequencing methodology that needs to be kept in mind as we approve testing that allows uh, the use of, of drugs with, with serious side effects. I'm curious about a comment you made early in your talk about leukemia, where you mentioned that there were 6,000 cases diagnosed in the United States every year. Of that one particular form? Chronic and you said there were 20,000 worldwide? No, no, I said 120,000. Okay. I guess it is important to keep in mind something, the, the distinction between incidence and prevalence. Because now, of course, people do not die within five years of diagnosis. They live a normal lifespan. So the number of people who are living with this disease has become very high. And that's an important point from the perspective of the drug companies, because you might argue this is a pretty rare disease, only 6,000 cases in the entire U.S. every year. Of course, when the drug was launched, the price was very high. Now the, the drug is coming to the end of its patent life, and the price is going to go down. It's an easy drug to make. Um, but there are a lot of people now, 
taking that drug. And not just people with that leukemia, because as I mentioned along the way, that drug is also useful for treating other cancers that have similar mutations. So the number of people in this country and now worldwide who will be taking this or other versions of uh, similar drugs uh, will become substantial, even as the price falls. Novartis has made many, many billions uh, from this drug, even though initially they were concerned about whether it should be developed because unlike the original target for this drug, which was atherosclerosis, a very common disease, this is a rare disease, by pricing it high in the beginning, this patent until patent life expires, and by keeping people alive uh, with a, while they're taking a drug that you can't stop. One of the things that's, that I perhaps should have emphasized even more is that many of these new drugs that are used to block the activity of, of mutant proteins have to be used continually. It's not like treating an infection that goes away. The, there are still some cancer cells in these individuals of very, very low numbers, and the general experience has been that in most cases, not all, but in most cases, uh, if you stop the drug, the cancer comes back. So that is uh, an important consideration in thinking about the relationship of what is sometimes called orphan diseases and drugs to treat rare diseases. Cancer is a common set of, of ailments, but uh, there's no, there is no cancer. I think you all appreciate at the end of this lecture that there is no cancer that is actually identical to the one any individual has. Every cancer is inherently different. And that, uh, that creates both dilemmas and opportunities. Thank you for coming to Stevens, and, and thank you for your leadership in many ways for many decades. Your presentation showed a lot of examples of molecular biology and cellular biology. I'm wondering if you can comment on the role of physical science and engineering in medicine as we go forward. Sure. Well, um, I, there are several ways in which to express that appreciation. I've actually, if you Google me in physics, you'll see I've lectured about this on several occasions, including the 100th anniversary of the APS. Uh, in, in 1999, um, but even from what I've said today, you can see a the the importance of uh, information technology and all the all the work that's gone into the development of that technology. Second, if you think about DNA sequencing, that's all based on machines that uh, that use um, all kinds of important tricks of physics. It's not we're not we're not talking about astrophysics here, but we're talking about uh, other forms of uh, of um, application of uh, um, detection systems and microarrays and uh, um, a, a dozen applications of, of physical principles. Nanotechnology has become a, a, a big field, though it's very hard to identify uh, specific ways in which, in which um, nanotechnology has helped us to deliver drugs. But in, in data analysis and in DNA sequencing and measurements of many other kinds of things, physical sciences have been, have been critical. Then there's a, the other element, which is uh, physicists who end up becoming cancer biologists, and there are quite a few of those too, as, as there have been in molecular biology since, uh, since the early days in, in which um, the principles of molecular biology was largely worked out, were, not, were largely worked out by physicists who've moved to a new field. Yes, uh, very uh, fascinating. I, I was interested though, one of the things that uh, uh, you didn't seem to go into or touch upon it was actually something that was an editorial in the New York Times by James D. Watson, who uh, was one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA. Uh, he was talking uh, about um, the uh, extensive use of uh, gene sequencing and so forth and, and how uh, positive that was. But he also brought up something called the Warburg effect, which was the fact that this is a very major observation <clears throat> that cancer cells and normal cells metabolize the fungible energy source, glucose, in completely different ways, and that that might, uh, an understanding of that might be a way to uh, um, uh, understand uh, the, the uh, proliferation of cancer and what triggers cancer. That's been something I've been very interested in. I just wanted on, uh, to understand your response to... Uh, what Jim said in that article was, was important, and uh, uh, I, wasn't, I would have liked to have gone off in that direction, but time prevented uh, going in all directions. I think there, I would rephrase what you said a little bit because for most of us, um, what the, the effects of, uh, of meta well, the, the, the metabolic changes that one observes in cancer cells, the Warburg effect, the high rate of glucose metabolism, 
is not so much a cause of the cancer as a consequence of mutations that affect genes that are involved that govern metabolism. And um, that does represent another way to approach treatment, not just reversing the product of the gene, but interfering with the, the high metabolic rate of a cancer cell. And that's a very important thing. But that's only one example of many kinds of mutations that affect processes in the cell that we didn't expect to have affected. So I'm glad you asked the question because I debated whether to get into that. Many of us who've been in this field for a long time expected most genes that are mutated in cancers to be genes that normally govern growth, cell death, differentiation, key elements and what's most obvious. Maybe they would affect whether a cell can migrate and invade other tissues. But we found that, that there are actually a lot of these newly discovered cancer genes that govern metabolic activity. There's some that govern um, how RNA is processed. Uh, that happens to be something that my own lab works on. There are factors in the cell, many of them, that govern the stitching together of RNA molecules to make what's called a spliced RNA. Uh, and there are many kinds of tumors that have mutations frequently that affect splicing factors that allow RNA to be spliced. How does that work? That's not so clear. Uh, there are lots of mutations that affect the way uh, DNA is assembled into chromosomes, or what's called chromatin. And you can imagine that those mutations might affect the way DNA is covered with proteins and therefore uh, read out to make RNA that then makes protein. Um, but the, these effects are very general because they affect lots of, 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 of the general components of chromosomes. And it's not so obvious how you move from a specific mutation to the, the biochemical effects that then promote uh, tumors, tumor cell growth. So um, if there had been another 15 minutes, I would have gotten into some of those things. But you're, you're right to point it out. But, this is, but, but what Jim is saying there is not in any conflict that I can see with what most of us are thinking about the genetic basis of cancer. It's just a, one of the manifestations of the changes in DNA that uh, uh, reaffirm the, the, the uh, musings of Otto Warburg many years ago and provide a number of important therapeutic, tar therapeutic targets that, uh, for which there are only now a few very promising drugs coming into use. Well, I, I wasn't uh, thinking so much in terms of uh, the drugs coming into use, more in, in terms of the fact that uh, uh, that the, uh, the concept that cancer is in every cell of our body uh, and uh, in the sense that uh, the, the, the DNA for that alternative form of metabolism that I was talking about, the uh, anaerobic glycolysis that's associated with cancer. Sure, but the And that's something that could be triggered by an environmental trigger, uh, such as, for example, the simple one would be the, the level of uh, glucose in the environment. Uh, I don't know of any examples in which uh, simple regulatory changes without mutations have been observed. Uh, the, you know, the, the ingredients that drive cell growth or um, uh, avoid cell death are also present in every cell in the body, and they seem to be only um, enhanced in cancer cells, or not only, only but ma mainly by mutation. So I don't think this reverses the mutational basis of cancer as a, as I, as a guiding principle. There are regulatory changes that occur, but I believe they occur in general as a result of mutations that affect uh, gene regulators. I, I have a couple of uh, concluding remarks. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you immensely on behalf of um, Stevens uh, for a fascinating, extremely informative talk that you gave. and for uh, highlighting the, um, uh, the magnitude of this challenge that, that you're dealing with. Second, I wanted to uh, wish you a very long life and a very productive career because the longer you stay on this job and the more you do uh, good work, all of us will, be, will benefit from it. I recognize that uh, we can't give you anything of monetary value because you work for the federal government. Nevertheless, we have a plaque to express our gratitude, and I'm going to just read quickly, presented to Dr. Harold Varmus in appreciation of your contribution to the President's Distinguished Lecture Series at Stevens Institute of Technology. Thank you. We are grateful to you. Thank you very much. And this is you.